and to see people who have at various times in their lives described themselves as patriotic Americans and all this kind of stuff, um, looking the other way and like trying to take the imperialists side in this, the word disappointing isn't, it actually doesn't capture it. It's just gross. It's fucking morally obscene. You've got to be able to identify with people who are getting subsumed and harassed by a big nuclear armed neighbor. And if you can't get there, I'm not sure what we can talk about. We know of new methods of attack. The Trojan horse, the fifth column. Oh, that's, I mean, this is, this is a common uh, thing that you hear from anti-interventionists from wherever they land uh, this week on the spectrum. What is the agreement that NATO violated right. by accepting well, yes, I, I, yeah. in, like the, there isn't any, it's amazing. Yeah. Like people are, there's still like journalism, like, oh, the nation or whoever has ripped the lid off the real, you know, the real betrayal, you know, new documents show, dude, there are no new there's documents. No. There is no new documents. This stuff was extensively, unlike, you know, the period under communism was documented because that's what At the, time. the West does. It documents a lot of what it's doing uh, diplomatically, not the secret dirty word shit, but like that stuff has been super well documented. There is no yeah. agreement that was violated. They just no, look for extent, it. You think we wouldn't no, be hearing the, it? You think it wouldn't be numerated? Right. right. The, in the extent to which that we relitigate this issue of NATO enlargement and that being to blame. I mean, when I was on my first book tour for the end of Europe five years ago, I got this question that like at every book event I did, every interview, like, didn't we promise the Russians that we wouldn't expand NATO after the fall of the Soviet Union? It's like, no, we didn't. But the extent to which that has sort of seeped into public consciousness in the United States, I find to be really uh, indicative of kind of how successful the Russian talking points are. Um, because as you say, it's completely false. You know, were there sort of, you know, were, were, were there conversations between certain Western diplomats, between James Baker or, you know, Hans Dietrich Genscher or Helmut Kohl and, and Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Yes, there were conversations about this, but as you say, there was no agreement. It would have been written down. It would have been codified. Um, and people also forget, you know, there was, there, there was talk about Russia one day joining NATO. There was, yeah. You know, back, yeah. In, the ni- back in the 90s when, when Russia was not, you know, uh, the dictatorship that it's now unfortunately become, um, this, was a, this was talked about. This was talked about somewhat seriously, you know, down the line, obviously. And by the way, there's, there was no, this was not a specific moment of, oh my God, they're actually going to join NATO now. That, that, this was not that moment. It's just the excuse being rehashed again. And obviously not of, of grave concern, because if you listen to the Putin speech, there's, the NATO stuff gets a few lines, but it's just this blathering on in which he blames the Bolsheviks, by the way, for the existence of um, Ukraine. And says that if you want to, I can't, the, the Russian, I, I don't know, there's not an English version of de communistify or whatever he was saying. If you want to do that to places like Ukraine, you have to basically give Ukraine back to Mother Russia because it was Lenin. He calls it Lenin's Ukraine. And it's actually a Leninist thing. I mean, if he wants to go that far, he would also realize that in places like Crimea, the reason that there aren't more native uh, Ukrainians in Crimea and they're more Russians was because Stalin deported on them all. So if we want to, we want to get actually serious about all of these little wrinkles of, of, of history. But the bizarre thing about this is that, you know, this is what all of these people who really know nothing about, about this stuff and haven't followed it at all are now litigating this in on Twitter, on television, on Fox News. I mean, on Fox, especially, it was so funny to watch a clip of Laura Ingram and the, the, uh, Lower third was all about the dreaded neocons and what the neocons are doing. Somebody who who once identified herself as the most hawkish person on the Iraq war. And these people turn on a dime. And it's because Donald Trump was being accused of, of being a Russian agent. And Malcolm Nance is in a spider hole on MSNBC. So I have to be on the other side. The level of stupidity in this debate is pretty shocking. And on the other, on the other side of this, like we haven't seen a lot of civilian deaths um, so far. But that doesn't mean they're not coming. And what happened in, I mean, how many were there in 2014? Uh, a lot. I mean, it was like 14,000 or something like that? No, no. Well, since, no, no, no. since 2014, there have been about 14,000 people. Yeah, that's what I meant. Since, from, yeah, yeah, been, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's been a low-level war 
going on in eastern Ukraine for eight years. People don't realize that, you know, and there's a there's casualties every other day. Yeah. And it's been like that for almost a decade. And so, yes, I think uh, the United States has an interest. Um, no one's proposing that we send American soldiers. That's a that's a red herring. Um, but to hear Tucker Carlson be like, well, why aren't you know, why do we support Ukraine over Russia? Why don't we support Russia? What's wrong with that? Um, it's really just the most disgusting moral equivalence. Um, and it's, and it's and not even, even the, uh, the, being, the, this is not our fight. It's, it's the like, why not? Why not? What do they used to say during, uh, during the Iraq war? It's like, he's not anti-war. He's on the other side. Mm. Um, mm. That's, that's where, that's where that's going. It's like, it, mm -hmm. it, I'm, I'm fine with the expression to an extent of this is not our fight because it isn't literally right. our fight. Okay, I agree with that. And and but like, you know, to the definition of warmonger and the way that it's used right now, there is who is out there advocating? Maybe you and an apple bomb and nobody else. <laughs> and not even you guys are yeah. are actually advocating a war. It's like this super weird phony argument. Like, oh, they're doing well, the it, the drums of war, they're beating again. Like, no, they're not anywhere. The well, only Russia, guy though. who's mongering the only guy who's mongering war, exactly, is Vladimir Putin, is the Russians. Um, so for these people to call themselves anti-war is just a total, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's as if there's a Russia nationalist thing that is really strong in a country that lost its empire and that it's a big part of its politics. You should have Alexander um, Dugan on the podcast it, like other people do. And it also <laughs> predated any talk of the expansion of NATO, motherfuckers. Yeah. Like that, that yeah. that's, that has been a thing that they've been doing the entire time. And that has impelled conversations about the expansion of NATO, which makes absolute total sense. If you're going to look at well, this is it, 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 go ahead. Chris. I was going to say this, the, the other, the other dumb talking point that they trotted out for a while was, well, how would America feel if Russia stationed, you know, troops in Canada and Mexico? I mean, you heard Tucker in the whole kind of, um, you know, Trumpy right wing anti-imperialist crowd trotting out that. Uh, and it's like, well, you know what? Mexico and Canada would never feel the need to join a military alliance with <laughs> Russia. <laughs> um, and if they did, then like, then, you know, then maybe America would be getting what it deserved. Because I mean, it, it's, such a, it's such a preposterous comparison. And they say this with a straight face. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that, that, that if, somehow... we had, if we had taken Quebec and um, maybe part of Saskatchewan, yeah. And stationed troops there. And then well, four, say, 40 years what, previous, we starved on? them to death, too, in a great, in a great well, genocide. <laughs> with what's going on, with what's going on right now in Ottawa, I mean, the massacres on the streets, the, you know, the women and children being, <laughs> being slaughtered by Justin Trudeau left and right. I mean, we do have to seriously consider um, – Beware sarcasm. Operation. You I better hope uh, Moynihan operation. edits this one quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, truth yeah. That's right. Because everyone come out. Now, in fairness, in fairness to our anti interventionist friends, uh, I'm old enough, and Kerchik isn't, to remember uh, 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 what happened when, like, there was some Soviet business in Central America, and we freaked out. We were like, "That's yes. bad. We've got to do weird things to stop it." Um, granted, evil communists are all around, and it was there. It was bad. But we did have a, a knee quaking moment. Um, but also that's back when there was a Cold War and people found use to take sides. And there just isn't anymore. I mean, China is trying to have its influence in a lot of far flung places, but it's just not the same thing at all. Um, and so there's no reason anyone would want it. Why would you cozy up with Russia if you were fucking Guatemala? Like there's just no percentage in it. Like it's not going – and I, I can't imagine us getting too upset about it. It'd be more like, what the fuck? Are you even to the humiliation point, you deserve to be fucking humiliated. You are the Soviet Union. You took over what percentage of the world at one point? And I keep on pointing out that uh, Christopher Andrews' book, the second book in the Matrokin archive is called The World Was Going Our Way. And that was like 1970s, where there was it was a really, really great time to be Soviet because you had far from places like South Yemen that were Soviet. Nicaragua then in 79 becomes a Soviet satellite. You know, Grenada's becoming a Soviet satellite all over the world. The world was going there when the non-aligned movement was was in a position of power at the time. And you lost. Guess what happens when you lose? The yeah. people that you humiliated in occupation, you humiliated them. That is the nicest thing that you can say about it. It's usually you tortured them, you arrested them, you deported them, you put them in the gulag, but you humiliated them. Let's use that stupid world. Yeah, but you did that, right? And then all of a sudden, they want some sort of protection. 
and they say, we don't want this to happen again. And you say, how dare you? How dare you offend those people? They were occupied and they were occupied by a bloody regime and the Ukrainians were starved to death in mass, mass numbers, in the millions. There is a film about this called Mr. Jones that you can watch, which is uh, Agnes de Holland, I think, made it. It's a, it's a terrific film. Mm-hmm. And there is Anne Applebaum's book. You can think Anne Applebaum is right or wrong about Trump and all this stuff, but read her book or Robert Conquest's book about it, and you'll understand the mentality of people that don't want 190,000 troops on their border. Seems pretty obvious to me. Also think about yeah. the, the, the notion of humiliation after World War II. There's a book out um, recently whose title I forget, but that talked about the uh, crazy period that's very underrated between 45 and 48. Because there was a lot of humiliation going yeah. on. There was a lot of, I mean, it, it plays big in uh, Czechoslovakia politics because you had the Benesh decrees of mm. basically, oh, you use Germans as an excuse? Sweet. Are you German? Mm-hmm. Fuck off. Uh, <laughs> are you Hungarian? You can also fuck off. Go go in that direction. There was a incredible amounts of population movement and people died. There were some death marches going on after the war because after all this ethnic cleansing had been used and a- ethnic excuses had been used by the by the overlords, those pe- Germans got humiliated a lot after World War II, and they deserved it. Um, we somehow only teach the humiliation after World War I as some kind of way to over-explain Hitler. It's an important piece of context, for sure. And, you know, there's a, a proportional uh, or an argument about proportion uh, after World War I, not just for Germany, but for Hungary and some other people. Um, but there was a ton of humiliation going on after World War II. And after the end of the Cold War, comparatively, not a whole lot. There could have been a lot of people expelled, a lot of Russians expelled from those countries. There could have been. Like, you know, uh, it's uh, Lithuania, right? It has the biggest uh, uh, Russian minority of like 20 uh, or 30 percent. No, no, they have they, the smallest. It's, um, or Latvia. Estonia, Latvia right? does. Sorry. La- Latvia and Estonia have the most. Yeah. Um, Latvia, you could understand them ethnically cleansing Russians, not support it, but you could understand it as a concept. Of course, it would have been really stupid. They would have been invaded by Russia. So there's a lot of problems going on. But like, you know, that could have been a direction that these things went, which is, again, and I've mentioned it before. But in the early stages of expanding NATO, one of the preconditions was, and they this degraded over time, sadly, was that if you want to join the club, you have got to solve all outstanding problems, any disputes about your territorial integrity, the borders around you, you have no problems with the neighbors, yeah. and you have no problems with ethnic minorities, uh, which was a sticking point for both Slovakia and Hungary to get in because they were fucking not really good with each other in the early 1990s for a lot of those same kind of reasons of of overhang um so there comparatively was not that much humiliation for russia the the humiliation was internal and jamie's right the partnership for peace was so called at the time because it wanted to be envisioned and the the central europeans were pissed off about this it wanted to be envisioned as something that even russia could join someday um and they hated that they're like no we don't want anything involved um, involving that at all so yeah humiliation is there's the comparative sense of it is all messed up. Um, we didn't actually humiliate Russia. Um, they humiliated themselves. Um, and then Europe screwed up by not figuring out its own sense of non America, non Cold War, non Russia security guarantees. I wish they would have. Life would have looked differently, but they just didn't do that. You know, it's um, funny that because there's the constant conversation um, about. You know, what is the purpose of NATO? Uh, NATO? Cold War is over. Well, I mean, Russian aggression has hit two countries close by that are not in NATO. So there's your answer. Mm-hmm. And when Jamie yeah. says that, will w- would Russia be willing to do kind of Cambodia-like cross-border raids into a country that is that is NATO allied? No, th- they won't. And I, I would say right. that the administration was pretty... Uh, pretty forceful today, I think. I think it was actually today or yesterday of uh, talking about its commitment to to the NATO Charter and saying that an attack against mm. any of these countries would be met with uh, devastating consequences. To say that is n- nothing, but it, it, it I, I would to say that is not nothing. It's not, not nothing. It's not nothing. Yeah, I didn't mean to say it's nothing. Um, so you know, it's a it's a pretty pretty firm verbal commitment. So that's a good thing. But I want to actually be clear about one thing. Because the conversation here is not about 
what the United States should do. Because I think that most of the people talking about this, most of the people talking about it on MSNBC or Fox or on Twitter are mostly morons who know nothing about it and have <laughs> very little interest in finding out about it and couldn't have given two shits about it last year or two years ago. This happens. It happens a lot in libertarian circles, which I know you're both familiar with, where there, if, if you're opposed to a particular military conflict, if you're opposed to the United States getting involved in a military conflict, a lot of people just can't end it at that. They can't just end it at saying, well, America, it's not our business. We shouldn't get involved. They have to come up with some kind of rationale. rationale. And so they go out, they go above and beyond and basically take on the arguments of the aggressor. Right. And so they basically come out defending Putin and saying, actually, Putin's in the right because the American ally that's trying to get us involved in this conflict, they're the ones who are lying. They're the ones coming up with all these uh, stories of atrocities. But in actual fact, they're the problem. And it's the aggressor who's getting a bad rap. And, you know, you saw this with Ron Paul. Uh, you see it with his son occasionally. You see it with Tucker Carlson. And like I would have, I would have respect for people who would just come at this from a very um, intellectually consistent position and say we don't support the United States getting involved in conflicts overseas. Period. End of. That's not my view, obviously. It's not your view, but I can respect that if it's intellectually consistent. Where I have a problem is where um, you see this with John Mearsheimer, you know, um, uh, and and Tucker and and lots of other folks where they actually have to make the argument, they adopt the argument of our adversaries. Um, and it's a weird kind of, I don't know what explains it. Maybe it makes it easier for them to make those arguments. Um, maybe it kind of salves their conscience, right? Because they, if because I mean, to me, if you look very objectively about what's going on right now, it's very clear who's, who's in the right and who's in the wrong, okay? Ukraine's not a perfect country, obviously. Have they made mistakes in this? Sure. But at the end of the day, you have one big bully is picking on a much smaller country that is sovereign and is having its territory stolen from it. Um, and perhaps in order to kind of justify your position of neutrality or, or not doing anything, you ha in your own mind, you have to come up with these excuses, right? So, well, maybe Putin has a point. Maybe this NATO enlargement was, a, was, was hostile. Uh, maybe the Russian, maybe the Ukrainians have been, you know, too mean to their Russian speaking minorities. And you come up, and, but then at, at, at the end of it, you end up basically becoming um, someone who's justifying really horrible things. Um, uh, I think that um, maybe a, a way that's more generous than how Jamie put it, or at least adds a different wrinkle, is that a lot of these people, they start from the position of what is the U.S. government telling us? What is the political class kind of all unifying to say? And so... Uh, we can assume uh, we could take the shortcut that sometimes gets us there faster as shortcuts do that they're lying or that they're deluding themselves or that enough people um, are talking to them off the record that they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. Um, and so if you start uh, as a, a kind of contrarian exercise to um, the American kind of foreign policy what's the blob, right? That's what they call it. Um, that they're they're exaggerating. They're calling someone else the great Satan. Um, that they're covering up their own, or they're minimizing their own role in past uh, problems. Um, you can get to some truths a little bit faster, um, and you can also get really super quick to going exactly to what you said. To like suddenly, you know, what 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 stupid thing is Victor Orban saying right now? Well, maybe. He's the real defender of Western civilization because the American foreign policy consensus hates his guts. Um, and it's like a lot of the stuff is easier to find than all of that. You know, you don't have to. Uh, there's, some, there's something that is so like American centric about it all, which is so weird for people who um, uh, imagine themselves. And I mean that in a value neutral way or depict themselves as uh, as being anti-imperialist. They're focused on what they see as the empire, which is the United States. And meanwhile, actual imperialism is happening. It's just, there's no other way to describe it. Um, one way to uh, kind of judge the intellectual seriousness of the argument is see where people have been using um, and defending the notion of the word sovereignty for the last 30 years. Um, and um, you're going to see a lot of 
weird flipping going on because for a really long time, especially during the Balkans, also during the Iraq war and during the post Iraq, uh, the Gulf war. And then uh, the period afterwards, the people saying the word sovereignty, the most uh, about us, this is something yeah. sacred that we should protect and not violate um, were tended to be China and Russia um, on the international stage, the whatever non-aligned countries that were left, um, but mostly them. And then people who gotten used to criticizing American foreign policy. And it was actually a pretty good critique, especially from the American point of view. Uh, I have argued for a long time um, that we've gone, uh, we have uh, degraded uh, the U.S. And now I'm talking, uh, we've degraded the notion of sovereignty from the point since September of 1990, I think it was, when, and please go look it up, when Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush joint press conference to address the situation in Kuwait said uh, a couple of things. Well, one of them is that it we should establish as a bedrock international principle that a large country cannot just simply subsume its neighbor. Right? Basically, that that language um, that got a, a bit obscured um, in the coverage because, of course, it's like the wow, it's a, the the enemy is agreeing, but also they use the word the phrase "new world order" a lot, <laughs> which is probably maybe not the best choice of phrasing uh, to describe that. But that's an important thing, and um, and actually, America in the cause of not a, not in the cause of the Gulf War. At all. The Gulf War was actually a sovereignty restoration act, regardless of what you think about it, regardless of what you think about Kuwait and how much you criticized the Kuwait back at the time. Um, it expelled Iraq out of Kuwait. It restored sovereignty to Kuwait. That was the whole purpose of it. Um, they didn't go all the way to Baghdad because that wasn't the job. Um, I think that a lot of American interventions, some of which I supported, some of which I opposed since then, uh, systematically degraded sovereignty. But what of the people who were using that word as a magic talisman? What are they doing now, this week? Are they saying that sovereignty is super duper important? I kind of don't think so, because sovereignty is getting violated in a way that is not unprecedented, but it is history making and it is awful. And if you don't have the moral imagination um, to acknowledge that and to express great sympathy for the people who are on the butt end of that, as Americans had no problem doing at all in 1956 in Hungary, 1968 in Czechoslovakia, 1981 in Poland, which is more of an internal crackdown, even 1953 in, in East Germany, right? We all, I mean, look at the bookshelves of all the books that were written, James Michener, people like that after 1956 in Hungary, it like awoke people's sense of imagination. And to see people who have at various times in their lives described themselves as patriotic Americans and all this kind of stuff, um, looking the other way and like trying to take the imperialists side in this, the word disappointing isn't, it actually doesn't capture it. It's just gross. It's fucking morally obscene. You've got to be able to identify with people who are getting subsumed and harassed by a big nuclear armed neighbor. And if you can't get there, I'm not sure what we can N talk Nor about. do you see.